Hi, this is Jay Hummel. Welcome to the deep dive in partnership with Investopedia, bringing industry leaders onto the show to talk about how can you deliver better client outcomes to your clients and, and how you can more effectively grow your business. Uh, we get a lot of questions about what's going on with the volatility in the marketplace and how people are using private alternative, private placements, alternatives. And I thought no better person to have on than Michael Bell, CEO of Makita Capital. Uh, Michael, thanks for taking the time to come on the show. Yeah, Jay, uh, thanks for uh, having me here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, maybe just tell the uh, listeners and viewers a little bit about you and a little bit about what you guys are doing at Makita Capital. Awesome. So um, I've been in the industry for, you know, I hate to say it, going on three decades, uh, primarily kind of the wealth management space, uh, ha had a couple of uh, pretty large RA platforms, um, one that we grew from uh, scratch, one that we kind of bought uh, and then uh, sold to a public company. And then alongside that, uh, I uh, built a 50 fund alternative complex kind of along the way. And so I've kind of mixed um, the uh, wealth management space and distribution of alternatives uh, for the last uh, almost three decades. Most recently, uh, I've launched a, um, uh, a firm that is providing you know, access to private market investments. We're doing that through uh, Makita Capital. Uh, Makita Capital is a subsidiary of Makita Investment Group. Makita Investment Group's been around for 45 years, uh, one of the largest uh, consultants uh, in the institutional space, uh, 250 uh, investment professionals across the country, uh, serving uh, all of the largest uh, institutions uh, across the, the, the country. Uh, they manage, uh, their clients manage almost $2 trillion of assets. Um, and um, Makita Investment Group has specialized uh, in the private markets arena for the last 25 years. So with that level of uh, specialization and expertise, we, we've coupled that with uh, some of the, the, the distribution experience that uh, our team has had. And we kind of put that together and we've launched uh, a couple of uh, funds that are in this trend of democratization of access to uh, private market investments. Yeah, because that's where I wanted to go next. You, there's a lot of things you could do, right? As you said, you've had a very varied career across technology platform to your lawyer by background. Uh, you chose to do this uh, with all your years of experience. What's the macro trend and, and why did you decide that this is the area in private uh, transactions, private capital markets is the place where not only in clients, but also advisors need to be focused. Well, it started coincidentally on the wealth management side, running a platform uh, that we bought, you know, maybe eight years ago, we had it for uh, three to four years, then we ended up selling it. At the tail end of that, um, we had about 100 advisors uh, kind of under the umbrella. Most were RIAs, some were IARs. Uh, the most frequent request that we had as the platform provider uh, that we could not fulfill was access to alternatives or access to private market investments. And this really, uh, Jay, I, I kind of describe it as kind of the country club conversation. It was, you know, some investor, their buddy was getting access to um, a, a private equity deal, or their friend was getting access to private credit or a private real estate deal. And they kept uh, bringing those requests to their advisors, who in turn would bring them to us. And we could not fulfill that because it was difficult to diligence. It was hard to get access to, to try to find the right level of expertise to kind of pull all that together. So kind of looked at that. that. You've heard me say this a million times. There's nothing worse than being an advisor and your clients are out doing cocktail party benchmarking and they come back. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's exactly right. But then the worst thing, I think, from an advisor's perspective is they're out doing cocktail benchmarking. Great. So they're coming to you to say, how can I get this? And you have to, and you go to your platform provider, which is the, the seat that I sat in, and we have to tell them, no, we, we, we can't do this. It's too difficult. We can't diligence. So we can't find the right um, uh, access point. And so it was really hard um, and it was discouraging from 
from uh, uh, sitting in the seat trying to provide this access to, to advisors and their clients to have to say no, no, and no. So after we sold that company, we, we said, uh, this is a real world issue, a real world problem. How do we address it? And, and so uh, that's why we started looking at this as a trend. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, sometimes you hit those trends right, and sometimes it's a bit of a misfire. But uh, starting kind of four or five years ago, uh, this has really become, I'll call it democratization of private market investments or access to alternatives. It's really become a mega trend shift. And um, it started with a very, very low knowledge base. Uh, it, it led, uh, most firms have led with education, product development. Now you're starting to see adoption rates start to spike and start to increase. And um, it, it's really now being embraced, uh, really, this year over the last kind of 12 months for the first time uh, by advisors and their clients. The questions I get all the time is, I don't know how to do due diligence and I don't like the fee structure. So how do you, how, how do you think helping, about helping advisors <clears throat> think through those, those two issues? So let's talk fee structure first. Um, I, I think the traditional wisdom, literally over the last 20 years, uh, has been um, financial advisors listening to their clients, uh, educating their clients that fees matter, right? Fees will uh, have some impact on your overall return profile. So there has been a, a significant movement to passive or index investing, low cost beta. Right. And, 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 and there is absolutely a place for that. And so uh, there's been a, a very significant movement into kind of low cost beta. However, if it, and, and that is really if you're going to match the market. Right. So find the lowest cost beta that you can. Now, if you really want to look at asset classes that have traditionally outperformed the market, um, th th those are access to private market investments. They, they have historically done that. And so we've seen advisors uh, not really shy away from um, the, the fee structure uh, on uh, uh, private market investments and embrace that as this is my alpha potential. I'm willing to pay up in terms of some portion of my portfolio to gain that uh, exposure to, to alpha. And some of the newer products that have been developed um, uh, really have an impact uh, on fees, and they're not the traditional two and twenty structures. Okay, so you're seeing fees even come down from a traditional uh, exposure to private markets from a two and twenty to fee structures that may be you know 150 or 200 basis points all in. So, uh, so you've seen some fee compression there, um, but we've also seen advisors embrace. Um, uh, you know, alpha potential and and be willing to pay up uh, for that. Now, in terms of your second your your, your second part of the question, uh, doing diligence, I think that is the most significant point um, th that re that advisors should understand and clients should understand uh, in this uh, new asset class that's opening up. So, what you're seeing is when I when I talk about private markets or somebody else talks about alternatives. What they're really talking about are access to private equity, uh, private real estate, private infrastructure, uh, and private credit. Okay, those, those asset classes are opening up. They're new asset classes. So they're for um, uh, your traditional wealth management channel, traditional financial advisors. There, there's not a whole host of uh, research that's available on those asset classes to begin with, or the managers in those asset classes. So I really think it's uh, useful to think of finding a guide, a Sherpa, to really help um, you through uh, this process. Somebody that's been doing that for years, somebody ha that has the level of expertise that can understand the top performing managers from the bottom performing managers, rather than looking at managers that are just open and available. Okay, and, and the reason I say that, Jay, the, I think the most important point in all of this is if you look at performance dispersion uh, from look at kind of large cap, uh, large cap growth funds, the performance dispersion between top quartile managers and bottom quartile managers. 
dollars. You're talking about a hundred basis points from the the, the best in, in 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 the industry to uh, th those lower performing managers. Now, if you pick wrong, it, it's not going to be a disaster. You don't want to do that, but it's it's not going to be um, uh, a huge impact to your end clients. In the private market arena, if you look at private equity, the difference from the top quartile managers to the bottom quartile managers, it's not 1%, it's 20%. So you have to know the managers or you're going to have a really bad experience for your your clients, which is obviously you know what you want to avoid. Think about changing the topic a little bit access you mentioned that you know there's just so much more access today than there was five to seven years ago because only the largest institutions played in these categories right and you're trying to i like the word democratization of it how if you're an advisor today and you talk to dozens a week how do you think about the vehicles to be in the private markets is it in funds is it in gplp is it doing sidecar directs is it all of the above how how would you, if you're listening to this show, think about accessing the kind of things you're talking about and what kind of vehicle structure? So, so I have a I have a bias on this, Jay, and the, the, my bias really comes from the couple of wealth management platforms that I ran, and um, I know that um, the, uh, the 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 commodity uh, that uh, is most precious uh, for advisors is their time. OK, and and so I, I look to be as efficient as possible in doing anything. OK, whether that's running your office, running your back office, running your investments, uh, uh, undertaking any business development efforts. How do you become more efficient? Right. And so th this asset class is opening up and it's now becoming more available to accredited investors, qualified purchasers and even uh, non-accredited investors. Um, and you have to be careful in terms of the type of investment structure that you access. Some of the uh, uh, the structures that are open and available now for accredited investors or even non-accredited investors, um, they look and feel like traditional GPLP structures. And what I mean by that, they have some higher investment minimums, they have uh, accreditation standards, they have subscription documents, uh, they have capital calls associated with those. And if you look at all of those individual components, they take time. Now, if you're staffed to kind of manage all of that, uh, you, you know, you can go down that road, but it takes a lot of time uh, for advisors to manage all of that activity. Or you can go the route of uh, some of the new products that have been developed uh, that really give pure play uh, access to some of these asset classes. Uh, you see that in tender funds or even more so in interval funds. And uh, many interval funds are literally point and click solutions, point, click and buy. They look, feel, act like from an operational perspective, mutual funds. They're on the traditional mutual fund platform. So you can buy um, uh, private credit. Uh, or you can buy private real estate, or you can buy private equity with a point, click, and buy solution. Now, the only difference there is the liquidity feature. Most mutual funds, you can buy one day and sell the next. Uh, in interval funds, you can buy any given day uh, that the market's open. But to sell that, to get liquidity, it's once a quarter. OK, uh, and there's traditionally there's traditionally some limitations around uh, that liquidity. Uh, so, so getting access, uh, there are a lot of different vehicles uh, that you can select. Some are much more time consuming. Some uh, provide a lot more efficiency uh, for advisors. You brought up a really key point, liquidity. I think that's the other thing you hear about. Well, I don't want to lock my clients up for five, seven, seven plus two, where I'm, uh, you know, I have them worried. You know, I, I would actually argue what one of the reasons these asset classes make a lot of sense is that they get rid of bad behaviors, not only from the end consumer, but also the advisor, where you have volatile markets and you're selling at the wrong time and buying at the wrong time. You know, I, I've never worried as much about the liquidity premium as long as you have the asset allocation right. But I was just I'm, I'm interested in how you think about that. So we put that. Uh, to the test, uh, to the market, to financial advisors. And, you know, it's really, uh, that question is one of the first questions that pops up. 
talk, talk to me about the liquidity features. So the liquidity features for a long dated asset class, private equity, private infrastructure, private credit, real estate, um, you're buying assets that are uh, that are on the books that are investments for five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years, right? In infrastructure, sometimes uh, 20 years, right? Uh, so those are long dated assets. Um, we've asked financial advisors, okay, uh, in terms of how much liquidity do your clients need? Let's look at some of the biggest market dislocations, you know, over the last decade. You know, the great financial crisis was a, a fairly significant drawdown over a long period of time. We looked at the COVID uh, shock. That was a really fast drawdown over a short period of time. And the volatility in, in, in the current markets, for example. Um, uh, advisors are traditionally spending time during those periods um, counseling their clients to stay invested in the in. market. Yep. You know, and, and and so they're not looking for a huge allocation to cash or looking for liquidity today on all those assets. So they're telling us we want to keep our clients invested in the market. And so liquidity features, especially if you're looking at a, a, a component, an allocation to private markets, it's not going to be 80% of your portfolio or 50% of your portfolio or 40% of your portfolio. If your whole private markets allocation happens to be 20% of your portfolio, that those are the last assets that you probably need to touch. And so when we walk through that conversation with advisors, they look and realize that, 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 that for the alpha potential that you can get exposure to, for the additional diversification that you can get exposure to, to the lower volatility that you get exposure to, it's worth the trade-off from a from a liquidity that is 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 probably not really needed uh, by a client, but it's good to be educated uh, on what the liquidity features are in the asset class. Well, and I've always said if we have a client who gets down to their last twenty percent, things have gone really wrong. Right? Right. On, no, that, that that's exactly right. On a lot of levels, if we're down to the last twenty percent, right. in in many cases, something has gone very badly. Right. No. Well, Mike, we, we, I, always we, have, yes, I always I always have really smart guests, which is always fun doing the show. That's why I love doing it. I always ask the question at the end. It's the last one I usually ask, which is, what do you think? You have such an interesting seat in our industry, and you have such a successful history. What's the one thing that you think people aren't talking enough about, or or focused on? It doesn't have to be in your swim lane. It could be a the industry in general. It could be in the private markets. Um, I'm just always interested to, to try to have our listeners hear from thought provoking people. So uh, I don't know if you have an answer for that. So, so I, I do, and it, it is in, in my lane and, uh, and Jay, it's, it's with this um, opening up of an asset class. I, I look at where we are right now in private markets it is kind of close to where we were in the ETF market 20 years ago. You know, the ETF market 20 years ago was a $300 billion industry, and people were still trying to figure out the mechanics and the structure and how this thing worked. And, you know, does ETF is an electronic funds transfer? No, not really. It's, it, it's a new uh, investment structure. Today, that $300 billion industry is $10.5 trillion. OK, so what happened along that way, well, what moved us along that entire spectrum was education. OK, and, and I think that that is vital. And, and I don't think that advisors can spend too much time educating themselves into this new asset class. It, it feels like for, for my seat that it's exploding, this asset class. But I would encourage advisors to uh, become really educated on the types of structures that are out there, on the types of vehicles that are out there, the asset class exposure that's available. Don't just get sucked in because it feels like a, a trend that you need to jump into. Get um, get backed by uh, someone that is really providing true kind of educational foundation because this is not just going to be a trend for you know today and yesterday. It's going to be a trend for the next several decades. Uh, and so, uh, get educated first. There are you know if I could just kind of put uh, one one uh, kind of pitch in. 
Uh, there are organizations that are out there that are looking at this, that are providing that education. Kaya is one of those, okay? To go get a Kaya certificate, it takes some time, effort, and energy, right? What they're doing now for financial advisors, they're doing micro-credentialing, okay? So you don't have to spend, you know, six months or a year studying for that exam. You can go get micro-credentialed in private equity. You can spend six hours and get micro-credentialed in private infrastructure or private uh, uh, credit or, or, or private uh, real estate. And so there are opportunities out there to understand it. Is it something that I think um, has a tendency to get uh, overlooked, but uh, go deep uh, kind of in the asset class, get an understanding of it, and you're gonna do so much better by your clients as a result. Now, how do people find you, Michael? Just uh, they, they hear your story, they wanna talk to you and the team at Makita. What's the, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Best way to, to, to reach me is uh, through Makita Capital um, and uh, the, the, the distribution team that we have uh, out there. We're, uh, it, it, we're public speaking kind of uh, all the time and, and trying to educate on this. Um, go to the Makita Capital website and uh, you can get access to me, uh, get access to the entire team and get access to the Makita Investment Group organization uh, that, again, has been doing this stuff for, for 45 years. Well, congrats on all the success, man. I know you've worked really hard to get where you are uh, in this Makita Capital journey. And I have a feeling you're only on the top of the second inning in a good way. Uh, I think the sky's the limit. So I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on the show today. Yeah, th thanks a ton uh, for having me, Jay. And, and thanks so much for uh, kind of driving this whole kind of education uh, perspective uh, for, for financial advisors. I think it's really going to uh, drive the next leg of, of this entire um, uh, investment uh, arena. I hope so. It's needed. So I hope you agree to come back in the future. Uh, thanks for those who checked out the show today. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time on The Deep Dive.